Would you like to know what I believe is the most terrifying experience in the entire world? Okay, I'll tell you. I think it's to not know who we are, what we're supposed to be doing, or where we're supposed to be going with our lives. And there's not really an easy way to answer those kind of questions because the answers are different for each of us. There is no one set path or formula or system you can use to figure out this is who I am, this is what I should be doing with my life. Case closed. I'm 100% confident in that. Most of us tend to just fall back on some kind of unconscious expectations from our society of how a human life is supposed to go, the expectations of the people we bring into our lives, our family, our closest friends, maybe the people we marry, to answer a lot of these questions for us. And if we were to let go of those kinds of unconscious expectations, then suddenly that burden to answer these really big, important existential questions would be all ours. And that is probably a very intimidating thought for most people, to take all that on themselves. My name is Gregory Deal. I'm an American personal development author of personal Armenian descent who has recently relocated here to this wonderful country of Armenia after spending pretty much my entire adult life exploring as much of the world as I possibly could, jumping from country to country, continent to continent, mostly driven by passion and curiosity to see as much of the human race as I could to understand how human beings work on a very personal as well as the larger sociological level, and then in turn understand more about myself and my place in this great big story called the planet Earth. I grew up in Southern California, lived a pretty ordinary existence there, and like most Southern Californians as a child and a teenager, there was always something I was supposed to be doing. There was always a pretty clear plan on how my life was supposed to go with limited variations upon that plan. You know, you grow up, you go to high school, you're supposed to prepare for college or start a career immediately out of high school, and you have this path that you're forced onto by the society around you. And that's probably true for most of you too, probably true for most people in the world. But the plan is different in each culture that you go to. I did have something else though going for me, even since early childhood, which was that I was always intensely passionate and curious about all things strange and unfamiliar. Whenever I became aware of a new part of the world, of reality, that I had previously not been exposed to, I often became obsessed with it, wanting to learn as much about it as I could, learn it from every possible angle and experience it personally, not just learn it in some kind of theoretical sense. This made me pretty reckless, pretty outgoing, and it manifested most predominantly in my life when I turned 18, finished high school, and made the spontaneous decision to get on a plane to another country. And it was just dominoes from there. Just kept going. Anytime I got bored with where I was, even if I didn't understand anything about the culture or the language or how I should live once I got to a new place, I wanted to see what part of the world have I not been to yet. What will I experience when I get there? How will it challenge my basic preconceptions, my assumed truths about how life has to work? I'll share a few examples with you. The kinds of things that any world traveler will tell you forces you to reconsider, again, not just how life works, but how potentially you as an individual can work too. What you consider normal and how arbitrary that really is. In the country Bulgaria, for example, when they nod their head up and down like this, what does that mean? It means no, Bulgaria. Weirdly enough, right? The kind of thing that you just assume is Universal, which means yes, right? And alternatively, side to side means yes, in Bulgaria. Don't know why that is, but it is. That's normal for them. On a somewhat more grandiose scale, I remember when I was in my mid 20s, I spent a weekend in Monaco, which is a micronation between France and Italy, less than one square mile in size, but has the world's highest concentration of millionaires and material wealth. It's just a bunch of very densely packed rich people stuff. And I mean, I've been to many wealthy, opulent countries before then, but I still was quite shocked 
just to really take in how important social stature and constantly displaying signs of wealth and importance was to seemingly everyone there, wearing the nicest clothes you could, eating at the nicest restaurants, throwing money around like it didn't mean anything, posing for pictures in front of exotic foreign cars, in front of these big casinos. It was just kind of a shock to my system. But again, to people who grow up in Monaco, this is normal. How else could life possibly go except this, right? On the opposite end of the spectrum, you have a place like Ghana, which I spent a few months in. And I remember at the time seeing in some places colonies of adult men who would live, sleep, eat, defecate, and seemingly spend most of their lives just along abandoned dirt roads with almost no material possessions whatsoever. That was normal life to them. And I think as a result of the fact that that was normal and they had little other perspective, they didn't complain about their life nearly as much as you would expect, even though you or I would probably consider that a really meager, unsatisfying existence. Though I do have to wonder if the poorest Ghanaians I saw could see how the wealthiest people in Monaco live, how would, their change, how would that change their perspective? Or vice versa, how would it change the perspective of the people of Monaco? On a darker level, I remember the first day I arrived in Iraq, and I was spontaneously warned never to make idle conversation with young Iraqi women in public, alone. Well, that was kind of weird. Why? Well, as it turns out, as I just discovered in that moment, if a girl's male relatives find out that she has been flirting with a foreign man like myself, of course, it has to be flirting if I'm talking to a woman, right? They might beat her physically. They may even kill her in the worst cases because they consider that bringing dishonor upon the family, in some families. This is called honor killings, and it's still quite common in many parts of the world. Sometimes it's even legal, it's not just culturally condoned. Some people believe that that is a normal thing to do if your daughter or your sister or your cousin were to dress too revealingly in public, she were to marry someone outside the family faith, or even if she were to get raped, an acceptable thing to do might be to murder her. Try to imagine growing up in such conditions that that was normal and unquestionable to you. That was just a part of regular life, as much of the things you take for granted about your own life are normal. Maybe the way you dress, the kind of people you hang out with. What do you think your life would look like to somebody who thought honor killings were normal? Who is the strange one in their perspective? It's all rather contextual, isn't it? So, as you can imagine, having this kind of very diverse series of experiences during my most developmental years, basically from the time that I was a teenager until now, going to 56 countries over the last 12 years so far, really, really forced me to change my understanding of who I was. I look back on the person that I thought I was when I started all those years ago in California. Honestly, I hardly recognized a certain principled things that remained true, but they were all buried beneath a whole lot of stories I had inherited from my upbringing around me, just as we all inherit stories from the place we all grew up. And now I believe that it is essential for each of us to expose ourselves to difficult, strange, foreign, sometimes exciting circumstances in whatever form they take, because that is the only way that we get the perspective outside of what we have arbitrarily learned about ourselves so far. Our pasts, our stories we tell about how we got to the place where we are now in our lives, those are, in my opinion, just what we've learned about ourselves so far. But it doesn't mean it's the whole story. Nobody knows the whole story. When does it end? It ends when you die. But how many changes can you make between now and then? And why do you have to be beholden to however you began your story? Sometimes there are real physical barriers that prevent us from doing what we want. Life is difficult sometimes, but I think, more often than not, my experience, it is our psychology and our emotions that prevent us from making any kind of radical change, even if we acknowledge that those changes would be beneficial and that we'd really like to do something, we just lack the permission to do so or we lack the familiarity with how to do that thing. We don't consider ourselves to be the kind of person who can go do something radically different than what we already know. So why don't we have these kinds of 
life-changing, perspective-enhancing experiences? I mean, we do sometimes, but why do we typically stop having them in our early 20s or maybe mid-20s? Why do we tend to settle into one way of living and say, okay, I guess this is who I am. This is the life I'm living now. Why can't we constantly be expanding and changing? What else could I become? How do I know what is really true about me underneath all these changes? What is not a product of my environment and is fundamentally there, remains there no matter what else happens all around me? I don't think you can figure that out until you've asked these kinds of questions and exposed yourself to the circumstances that force you to introspect enough to get those answers. So let me ask you a few more slightly uncomfortable questions. I'm not doing this just to annoy you, because I believe there's a point to this if you take these kinds of things seriously, as I obviously do. What do you think you would spend all your time doing if no one had ever told you what to do? You can answer that question, and also try to think, why don't you spend all your time doing that? Good question. Is there something real, physical, tangible stopping you from doing that? Or you just don't give yourself permission to do that? Because you don't think that's the kind of person you are. That's another way of asking, who would you be if no one had ever told you who to be? What is unchangingly true about you? What defines you from another person? Is it that you come from a certain country? So that your hair is a certain color? That you belong to a certain social class? That you enjoy certain kinds of hobbies? What is it? And what then do you think you would find most sustainably meaningful and fulfilling to do with your life? Throughout your life? What category of experience would fit that role for you? Why don't you do that with your life? I'm not trying to say that every person in the world needs to get on a plane to the other side of the world, begin to understand who they are, right? It's kind of a big step. But for me, that was a very useful catalyst for the kind of person I was and where I was in my life and what I had the opportunity to do. It's not everyone's path, though. However, whoever you are, and wherever you come from, whatever you currently think about yourself, I do believe that in some way, shape, or form, you need to expose yourself to intentionally difficult, strange, and intimidating experiences. You need to do something that you consider to be impossible as the person you currently believe yourself to be. Maybe you'll be right. Maybe it'll be a horrible experience. Maybe one of the worst things you've ever done. Maybe you'll get physically or psychologically injured somewhere along the way even. Or it may be amazing. It may turn out great. But either way, you will learn something about yourself. And through that perspective now, of what you are not and what is possible, you can begin to really focus more and more on that central issue of who you actually are when you've broken away everything else that you're not. I'd like to end this talk with a quote, actually, from a pretty recent superhero movie. Some of you might have seen it. It's pretty popular. It's called Avengers Endgame. Anybody heard of that one? One or two of you? Okay. Uh, oh, so three. The quote is directed at the character Thor when he is experiencing a very difficult time trusting his ability to be the person that his friends need him to be, his fellow superheroes need him to be, and even his entire race of people are counting on him, expecting him to be. It comes from his mother. She says, everyone fails at who they're supposed to be, Thor. The measure of a person, of a hero, is how well they succeed at being who they are. It's very appropriate that it's a superhero movie because to me a superhero is somebody who has chosen a set of ideals to embody and align their identity with regardless of the expectations of normal society all around them. To become superhuman, more human. To not let other people's expectations tell them what to do. Even when they face great resistance. Because how else do you really know that what you think you want to do and what you really care about is in fact authentic to you if you did not have to face great resistance and difficulty to do it. And if that still remains true, even when the entire world is working against you and it's the most difficult thing you've ever done, maybe it really is part of you. But you won't know that until you've thrown yourself into difficulty. So thanks for listening, and I hope everybody here finds some way to just introspect and ask themselves these kinds of difficult questions, and when necessary, 
when they're ready, take the right physical steps to enact these changes in their lives.